All right, guys, here we go on chapter nine of George Washington Socks. Adam Hibbs, did you hear that? Q whispered in Matt's ear. He's Adam Hibbs. Matt shot a glance at Tony and Hooter, who were both staring at the young rebel. Tony looked at Matt with his mouth dropped open. Matt tried to smile. If it's the same Adam Hibbs, then he'll know about the lake and the rowboat, and he can tell us how to get back. Matt leaned over and whispered to his comrades. If that's the same Adam Hibbs, Q said, his voice beginning to go from a low whisper to a high squeak. If that's the same Adam Hibbs, what's he still doing here? A cold, sobering feeling filled Matt's entire body. He looked back up at Adam Hibbs, who nodded, nodded knowingly in his direction. The way the man stared at Matt, at him, Matt was certain he was the same Adam Hibbs. Before he had a chance to think any further on the subject, Matt's attention was diverted to another matter. They had finally reached the other side of the river and the long Durham boat was guided out of the tangle of ice and came to rest on solid ground. There was an eerie quiet as the soldiers poured out of the boats, silently clutching their muskets. No words were spoken. No one dared break the stillness that ensured their safety. Even the horses had quieted down, glad to be off the water and a little suspecting uh, glad to be off the water and little suspecting the dangerous ground they approached. Matt knew that that surprise was essential for their survival. He remembered reading that while the tough professional German soldiers slept off a night of Christmas celebrations in Trenton, Washington's men would be creeping along the river and then turn inward to surprise the enemy, just as dawn broke. As their boat emptied out, the boys stretched their legs. It had been a cramped voyage, for the boat had been filled to capacity before they came aboard. The last remaining soldier shook hands with, uh, with Corporal Hibbs. Matt watched as the young rebel stood and hugged his fellow soldier goodbye. Godspeed, Thomas, Adam Hibbs whispered. Both soldiers looked to be about the same age, and Matt wondered if they had been friends long. He imagined they had been through a great deal of hardship together, for he could feel the sadness and fear at their parting. It was a parting all of them knew what could well be their last. Katie, who had slept through the entire voyage, suddenly turned in her sleep, throwing off part of the cape that covered her. Looking down, Matt remembered the general. His cape! He'll need his cape! Matt thought as he hurried as he hurriedly unsnapped his down vest. He took off the vest and then lifted Katie out of the cape and into Q's arms. He shook the, vet, the wet vest over the side of the boat and then wrapped it around Katie, trying to keep the dry side of the vest close to her. Then he turned to Adam Hibbs. The general forgot this, he said, holding the cape in his arms. He'll need it for the march, won't he? Adam Hibbs frowned. All the soldiers had left the boat, and the oarsmen that remained were giving orders not to leave their were given orders not to leave their craft. The young corporal knew that his responsibility was to guard over the children, but he also knew that the general should have his cape. All right, you take it to him, but straight away and don't tarry. I'll be keeping an eye out for you on you from here. He warned. Matt looked back at Q, Tony, and Hooter. He couldn't believe his luck. He felt that, in a way, he was taking part in the revolution. He was returning the mighty general's cape. He had been given the responsibility of keeping the father of our country from freezing. He climbed out of the boat, feeling like a true rebel. Matt was glad that he had worn his old hooded blue sweatshirt rather than his new red one his mother had wanted him to wear. They would have thought it was a red coat for sure, he thought, making his way through the groups of soldiers that were on the shore. As he walked along, Matt noticed that each regiment seemed to have a different uniform, and they weren't all blue. There were soldiers in green, blue, brown, and beige coats. Some wore, some wore three-cornered hats, while others had 
round felt hats with feathers. Still, others wore headbands with the words liberty or death stitched on them. He now understood why this new American army was called Washington's Ragtag Band of Rebels. However, in spite of their unprofessional look, Matt marveled at the soldiers' determination. Many of them wore linen shirts and pants that were tattered and frayed at the knees. A great number were in rags, wore a great number were in rags wrapped around their heads or legs and feet. In every group, two or three men stood coughing, their thin frames shaking as they clutched their chests in pain. As Matt came close, he could smell the sweat and dirt of clothing that hadn't been washed in weeks or months. Yet even in these miserable conditions, Matt could feel the excitement in the air. The silence of the ragged rebel army could not conceal their hope and joy. They had trusted their leader, and he had not let them down. General Washington had gotten them across the treacherous Delaware, and he had promised to prom and he had promised a feat the Hessian mercenaries would not even attempt. Matt could almost taste the rebels' determination, and he felt proud to be walking among them. He pretended that he was one of them, and he made his as he made his way up to a group of officers that were surrounding the general. He tried to inch his way into the huddle when a large hand was suddenly on his neck. Just where would you be going now, lad? A heavy set captain whispered. He was holding Matt by the back of his sweatshirt and had lifted him up off the ground. The general's cape! I'm, I'm giving him his cape! Matt sputtered. The general's busy conferring with his officers, but give it here and I'll see that he gets it, the captain said, reaching for the cape. He had thick, wild eyebrows that were frozen in different directions, giving him the look of a madman. Matt didn't argue. He was about to turn and head back to the, to the boat when the captain grabbed him by the arm. Come now, son. You don't look old. You don't look old enough to hold a musket. Just what regiment would you be with? The captain had his face close to Matt, and Matt could smell the sour rum on his breath. A, a regiment? Um, I'm from the boat. I have to get back on the boat, Matt pleaded, trying to back away. No, we'll not be returning to the boats tonight. The captain shook his head. Tonight, I'll wager, we'll be sweeping those Hessian pigs off the streets of Trenton. He tightened his grip on Matt and was leading him away from the shore. But Corporal Hibbs, I'm to return to the boat with Corporal Hibbs, Matt cried. Hush now, lad, the captain whispered, pulling Matt along. This is no time for turning back. You wouldn't want to let the general down now, would you? But, but, Matt stammered. Hush now. The captain put his hand over Matt's mouth. As they passed a flat boat that was being unloaded on the shore, the captain reached in and pulled out a musket and a cartridge box from a pile of guns. He shoved it into Matt's hands. Aye, now, don't you look the rebel terror, he laughed under his breath. Matt felt the heavy weight of the musket in his hands. He looked down at the cold, pointed spike of the bayonet, and he was suddenly filled with terror. He couldn't think he couldn't think that he would know how to use it. This was all a mistake. He wasn't a rebel. He was just a kid from the 20th century who lived in a condo and watched TV and ate food and was that was cooked in a microwave. What did he know about bayonets and Hessian pigs? He turned his head. He turned his head, straining to see down the shoreline. Where was Adam Hibbs? Why hadn't he come after him? The march to Trenton was to be a silent one. Many of the farmers and citizens along the Jersey side of the Delaware were known to be loyal to King George. If they were to stay alive, the rebels would have to make the nine-mile hike as soundlessly as they could. It was due 
It was due to this enforced silence that word of the accident that befell a certain Corporal Hibbs never reached most men. As they marched noiselessly they over the frozen ground, most of his comrades were unaware that Adam Hibbs lay bleeding, with his head resting on Hooter's on Hooter on Hooter's lap. It seemed the young corporal had been standing in a boat looking up the shore when he stumbled and fell on his own bayonet. They had sent him back across the river with the children to McConkie's Inn. A corporal Neely accompanied them as Adam Hibbs was not expected to live the night. But Matthew Carlton knew one knew none of this. All he knew was that he had somehow gotten himself into what had once just been a daydream. He was now a rebel soldier in the middle of the Revolutionary War. Only now that the daydream had come true, it seemed more like a nightmare.